I think that's when God writes his law upon our heart, when we get broken before him. Well, we sang the song, Raise Up an Army, O God, and that's what we hope to do because it seems as though the, the payload is getting heavy for us older ministers, and we need to see some young blood getting into the, the act here. The harvest has never been greater, and the laborers have never been few. So we really need to see a move of God. Amen. Once again, I'm going to depart from the usual sermon format. And we're coming back to John's epistles. I'd like to open up to John. That is 1 John, John's epistles. Very relevant for today's church. And just to refresh us a little bit, John is basically contending with certain heretical winds that are taking the church off course. This is at the end of the first century. John is like the ancient landmark. He is like the pillar that is keeping the, the church of his day on course. You know, we can thank God for some of the ancient landmarks that have been, like Pastor Bailey, who is who's been a guiding pillar that's kept the church from going over the boundary. But here is John at the end of the first century. The church is really drifting, and there are certain heretical groups, especially the ones mentioned last week, the Gnostics, the Nicolaitans, and the Docetists. And uh, John is very redundant on certain issues, especially the definition of sin and righteousness. Now, what is sin? But the breaking of the law. The problem was that some of these heretical groups were actually contending with John by using the scriptures because they were saying, well, you know, sin is a transgression of the law, but we're not under the law, we're under grace. So that made great tolerance for whatever they did. And some of them were saying the sins of the flesh really did not matter to God. And, and so they were denigrating the commandments. And so John makes it clear that love is keeping the commandments. In fact, we cannot love man or God, without keeping the commandments. There's no way you can break any of the six commandments given to man and love man. You can't steal or lie or commit adultery and say you love your brother. You have to keep the law. Love is the fulfilling of the law. Amen? So sin is the transgression of the law or the commandments. Love keeps the law. And John hits this a number of times. He uses the word sin 28 times in his little epistles. And so we're picking up in 1 John chapter 2. And uh, he begins, My little children, these things write I unto you that ye sin not. And if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. So John is continuing the thought from chapter 1 that we need a present tense relationship with God. When we sin, we've got to come back to the blood of Christ and get things right. Remember that Christ came to save us from sin, not in sin. You have the impression today that that God just kind of loves you in spite of all of your sins. No. He came to deliver us from sin. He came to save us from sin. And yet, in the human struggle, man is going to fall short. And we're going to do that until we have victory. We are up and down in the early part of our experience, especially up and down, until we have the victory, and then God wants to give us dominion over sin. It's not an eradication of the sin nature, but it's dominion over nature. And so when we sin, we have to come back to our advocate, 
What is the advocate? The advocate is our defense lawyer, and he pleads our cause for us. And, of course, he lifts up his hands, his wounded hands plead for, pleads for us. And so he's going to defend us at the bench. We have the prosecuting attorney on the other side, Satan, who's saying, condemn them, they're guilty, which is true. But then Christ at the other end of the bench saying, but I paid the penalty. Amen? I, I saw a little picture once of a cross with a, a banner across it, and it said, paid in full. And I, I like that, and I don't mind repeating that, that he paid in full for us. So when we do fall, we need to come back to our defense lawyer, our Jesus Christ, the righteous. And, of course, God listens to him. Amen? He's, he's not listening to us, per se. He's listening to us through Christ. So we have to come back to our, our lawyer. So Christ says, but I paid the price, and so we're forgiven. Going on to verse 2, 2 John. First uh, John chapter 2, verse 2. It says, And he is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. Now this word propitiation means the appeasement. Christ appeased the wrath of Father God by taking the sins upon himself, and because he was a perfect Spotless sacrifice, God was appeased for our sins, for the sins of the whole world, for all time. He is the propitiation for the sins of the world, for all time. So if anybody says, well, I'm not good enough, they're saying, in effect, the blood of Christ isn't good enough for me. I'm so bad that even the blood of Christ isn't good enough for me. Now you know that, that doesn't, that's not going to stand, Right? The blood of Christ is good enough for the sins of the whole world for all time. But we need that present tense relationship. So that was the purpose of God becoming man. We went through that many a time in past lessons. In verse 3, And hereby we do know that we know him if we keep his commandments. So, and, you know, we're, we're, we see this time and again, because John repeats this time and again. But Christ raised the standard, if we keep his commandments. Jesus said, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. And his commandments are not grievous to us. These people that say, well, we don't have to, we're not under the law, and, and the law is bondage, and that kind of thing. Well, the ceremonial law was bondage, but God's moral laws were never bondage. They were put down to keep us from going into bondage. The end of that, we can't honor our master unless we obey him. So here is the abiding position in Christ. If we keep his commandments, and not only that, as John tells us in his gospel, Chapter 15, that if we do keep his commandments, we'll abide in his love and we will bear fruit. Fruit, more fruit, and much fruit. Verse 4 He that saith, I know him, and keepeth not his commandments, is a liar, and the truth is not in him. Now, the reason I got into this study anyway is because we are finding that the same drift that was taking place at the end of the first century is taking place today. And this idea that we don't have to keep the commandments and we're not under law, but we're under grace, needs some definition. And we find ministers that are going through great lengths 
just to try to prove that we're not under law and that no matter what happens, no matter what we do, that it's overlooked by God. And that's what they call grace. That's false grace, folks. Amen? False grace. The new covenant is a law written upon the heart. We just sang that song, didn't we? And when Jesus taught the Sermon on the Mount, his message on the Mount, he was introducing us to the new covenant, which is higher standard. The laws that Moses gave, even the moral laws that that Moses gave, were, uh, you know, relative to the physical realm. Thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not commit adultery. And Jesus lifts that standard much higher. And he says, well, Moses said, don't do it. I say, don't think it. Thou shalt not kill. I say, if you hate your brother, you're a murderer. Jesus raised that standard all the way through. We can steal spiritually, even if we don't naturally steal. We can take the words of people and make pretend they're ours or something. Jesus raises the standard. That's new covenant, and God wants to write that upon our hearts. It really takes a certain brokenness of heart to have those laws written. You know, when we're prideful and arrogant, uh, full of self, those laws aren't written on our heart. It's only in, in a broken state where God really pens those laws upon our heart. Amen? The law came by Moses, but it says grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. Grace and truth. Truth. You know, if you take a look at the law in the Old Testament, it's behind the curtain. The Jews could never understand the spiritual implications They could never see the spiritual implications written in the law because that curtain was there. But, of course, Christ rent the veil. Christ came with truth. He he has given us an understanding, a spiritual understanding of his ways and the grace to live that message too because the message of true grace is power to live the life, not power to get away from it. Now, you know, I, I'm repeating things here, but as I've said, you have to hear something two or three times before, you read, before it registers anyway. But in Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 15, and also in Colossians chapter 2 and verse 14 and 15, without turning there, time's sake. The law that was nailed to the cross was the law of ceremony contained in ordinances, touch not, taste not. All of the holy days, uh, all of the ritual of the law was nailed to the cross. That part of the law ceased. God's moral law never ceased. It never ceased. And somehow I hope that we can, even as we travel in Asia, can, can make the point. <laughs> because there's, a, there's quite a drift there, and especially in certain parts of Asia. The, in fact, the biggest church in Asia is a church that actually denigrates the commandments. And says, you know, we're not under law, we're under grace. And once we have come in, why, we're in. Well, I know that's Calvinistic, but he goes even beyond that because even the Calvinists don't go to the extremes that this particular man does. So, we need to understand that what separated the Jew and Gentile anyway it wasn't moral laws. It was a law of ordinances, touch not, taste not, Come not nigh me. You're in this camp. I'm in this camp. And the, never the twain shall meet. And that was the law of ordinances. The Lord took away those ordinances 
so that he could make one out of two groups of people. Amen? He took that law of ceremony to the cross, thus making it possible for Jew and Gentile to, to exist together. Not just coexist, but, I mean, in the bond of, of unity and love. So the Lord magnified the law. He never took it away. The law, I'm hammering on this, the law, commandments, um, were not the problem. And Paul tells us that in Romans 7. He says the, the, the law is holy and good. What is the problem then? <laughs> the problem is in me. The, the law is good. The problem is in me because I react to the law. Paul says this in Romans seven fourteen. The law is spiritual. I am carnal. So it's really not until we identify with the crucified Christ that, that the law has no ill effects upon us. We don't feel any, any condemnation from the law because we're above it. We keep it. <laughs> the law is going to condemn you if you're keeping the law. Amen? I mean, if you're breaking the law, you deserve to be condemned. <laughs> if you're living in sin, you deserve to be condemned. That's legitimate condemnation. Scripture says there's no condemnation to those who walk in the spirit and don't yield to the flesh. Okay, going on in chapter 2, verse 5. But whoso keepeth his word, in him verily is the love of God perfected. And hereby know we that we know that we are in him. Whoso keepeth his word, in him verily is the love of God perfected. See, John really, really is redundant on this point. He talks about love at least 47 times in these little epistles. And this is, in herein is the love of God perfected. And those who keep his word. Now, you know, just searching this out a little bit in, in the, some of the Greek texts, it's not just the idea of keeping the commandments here, but it's, it's the word that God speaks to us even in the communion life, in prophecy, in things that he speaks into our heart. It says, now, Danny, you know, I want you to set aside this or do this or that. And, you know, those who keep that word, see, it's not just keeping the commandment, but it's keeping the word that God speaks into our heart as well. It could be through prophecy. It could be through our meditation life or from the word itself. That God speaks something special to us. And those who keep that which God commits to them, the love of God is perfected in their life. God perfects us as we're obedient to the things that he speaks to us. Are you with me here? So it's in that communion where God speaks and we say, yes, Lord, I'm going to do it. I mean, we can all bring up certain things in our life. Maybe it's not in the scripture per se, verbatim. I mean, the Lord dealt with me years ago on hunting. Now, he doesn't deal with everybody on hunting. You know, with hunting, not everybody has a love to go hunting like I did. But he said, Danny, this has to go. Well, I, I struggled with it for quite a time in prayer, but finally I said, yes, Lord, it's going, it's gone. See, these are the things that God speaks into our life. It's not always... You know, something that's spelled out in the Ten Commandments, but it's something that God speaks through the communion life. And we want to be faithful with that. Amen? You know, Revelation 3.8. Here's a good supporting verse. 
The Lord said to this church, this is Philadelphia, He said, I know thy works. Behold, I have set before thee an open door. No man can shut it, for thou hast a little strength. Actually, that interprets the few in numbers, this church, Philadelphia. And has kept my word and has not denied my name. You've kept my word. The word of my patience, as he goes on in another place. So when God speaks, and sometimes we wait and wait and wait, wonder when the fulfillment is coming, and still we wait for God to come through. You know, these are the people that are proving their love for God, and the love of God is perfected in their life. Amen? Going on to verse 6, chapter 2, verse 6. He that saith he abideth in him ought himself also so to walk even as he walked. So there's another proof of our position in Christ. If we're going to be disciples of Christ, what is a disciple anyway? It's one who imitates his master. So we're going to walk the way that he walked. Now, Christ was very careful about how he presented himself to his disciples. He said, for your sakes, I sanctify myself. In John 17, I, I am going to control myself. I'm going to discipline myself so that you don't have anything negative to imitate in my life. I mean, the way that Christ dealt with situations the way that he looked, you know, there's something about a leader that when something happens, everybody immediately looks at the leader to see what his reaction is going to be. So if the leader's there rolling his eyes like, oh, you dummy, you know. You know, they pick up that kind of, you know, flavor from the leader. That Christ was very careful in containing himself and everything that he did so that his disciples could not imitate anything negative. So there was great discipline in his life. We're to walk as he walked. Now, there's a little, a little incident here this is right before Jesus' trial. Well, actually, it was during Jesus' trial. And Peter is there. He's standing by the fire, keeping warm. And um, a little maid comes up to him and says, well, Surely you're one of them because your speech betrays you, bereath you, betrayeth you. And, of course, it was his Galilean accent that gave him away the... Uh, the Galileans who were hanging with with Jesus. But uh, there's a little bit more to it than that. Thy speech bereath thee. Thy speech betrayeth thee. I hope that our speech betrays us. That we're on, we've been with Christ. That when we talk, people sense that they're different than we are. They, they've been with Christ. That's the idea, right? That we walk as he walked and allow him to do something in our hearts so we talk like him and imitate him so that people see Christ in us. Okay, now John is going to give a new commandment, which is not a new commandment, but an old commandment. So, in verse 7, Brethren, I write no new commandment unto you, but an old commandment, which ye had from the beginning. The old commandment is the word which ye have heard from the beginning. Again, a new commandment I write unto you, which thing is true in him and in you, because the darkness is past and the true light now shineth. So, 
Jesus saying, I'm giving you a new commandment, which is really an old commandment, which you've heard from the beginning. But what makes it different? Uh, I mean, there has to be something different about this new commandment that was different from the old commandment, even though it was the same commandment. Am I confusing you yet? Well, as Jesus said, because the darkness has passed. Now, we're talking about heart condition here. We're looking at the same commandment through a different set of eyes. You know, if you go back into the Old Testament and look at that commandment, they were looking at it simply through eyes of the flesh, whereas there's a heart conversion now, and so we're looking at something through a different set of eyes. You know, it's like this. I remember when I really had a conversion in my life. I'm not talking about just getting saved, but I mean a real conversion. And there's a difference. But it was as though I started to hear the birds singing for the first time. Now, the birds were always there and the birds were always singing, but I was hearing something different now. Why? Same birds singing the same song. It was because my heart had changed. Are you with me here? So, it's a new commandment, but it's an old commandment. We're looking now through the eyes of Christ. And just for verses here, you could put Second Corinthians four six, Second Peter one nineteen. Well, maybe I should read some of this. Why don't we read Second Corinthians four six? Second Corinthians four six says, "For God, who commanded the light to shine out of darkness, hath shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ." See what Jesus, or what John said in, in his epistle. He said, because the darkness is past, and now the true light shines. That's what made the commandment different. The darkness is past. And now Christ is shining in our hearts. And now we're re- looking at this commandment differently. Or as in, it says in 2 Corinthians 5.17, Therefore, if any man be in Christ... He's a new creature. Old things are passed away and all things are becoming new. So we're looking at the same commandment with a different set of eyes. Now, if you go back into John's Gospel where he gives this this new commandment, he actually upgrades he actually upgrades this commandment because he uses the same expression in his gospel, and he's, he's using two Greek words, two different words here, two different forms of the word love, and he's raising it from agapeo, which is love. That is the one that God gave us right from the beginning, that we are to love one another in the moral, social sense of the word. But this new commandment, he upgrades it to agape, which is dear, supreme love. So we're all commanded to love one another. That was a law that goes back to the Garden of Eden, that we're to love one another in the moral, social sense. That we don't walk about by the man bleeding on the Jericho Road and say, well, have a nice day. We stop and, and show love in the moral, social sense of the word. We love one another. We care for one another. You see that in this country, but in some countries, you don't. People walk by the bleeding and dying in the road, and you're forced to do the same thing when you're there. There's nothing else you can do. But it's a different spirit in many of these countries. That's what sets America apart. It has in the past, anyway. That we're a Christian nation, in spite of what our president says. We are a Christian nation. And God is going to bring 
repentance to this country through some very unpleasant means, but it's coming. And in the end, God will restore the church in this country. But if you want references here for John's Gospel, you could put John 13, 34 through 35, which tells us we are our brother's keeper. Okay, going back to 1 John 2, 9, He that saith he is in the light and hateth his brother is in darkness even until now. He that loveth his brother abideth in the light and there is none occasion of stumbling in him. He that hates his brother is in the dark. Uh, how can anybody possibly hate a brother one for whom Christ gave his life for. I mean, here we are in the church. He, John is basically addressing people within the church. But if Christ bled and died for everybody here and gave his life, he loved people enough that he would die for them. And we hate them. Something that doesn't quite click there, does it? It just doesn't click. And so that he that says he hates his brother is not in the light. <laughs> Something that is missing there. He's in the dark and Christ needs to dawn in his heart. Because God is love. And so there's going to be at least an earnest, a little token of love that births in his heart when he's saved. Amen? We went to a church for about number of years where there was a brother who sat on the bench I would say 50 to 60 years of his life and he sat there like stone because something had happened when he was maybe in his late 20s where the pastor had um taken the funds, and I think there was immorality also associated with the whole thing. And he had invested some of his money into this church. It was a new church and so on. And After that happened, this man's heart went to stone because of what had happened in this church. He would not forgive it. He would not let it go. And so he sat on that bench for 50 to 60 years, we knew him. He was a nice man. Uh, we ate at their house. They used to visit us back in those days. And different pastors, you know, there's a denominational church, so there was a change of pastors, and different ones would deal with this man. But he would never hear it right to his dying day because he was a veteran. He went to Philadelphia in the vet's hospital in Philadelphia and pastor went all the way to Philadelphia, tried to get him to forgive what had happened. He said, no. You know, here's a man who went to hell because he wouldn't forgive his brother what happened. I mean, obviously. You know, you have to forgive somebody, at least in your heart. And he said, no. He, he'd rather go to hell with, with that Unforgiveness. I mean, throughout eternity, is it worth it? And the interesting thing is that sometimes even people that do these kind of things that this pastor did, maybe repented, and he ends up in heaven, and this guy ends up in hell. It's not worth it. He that hates his brother is in darkness. And then John points out in chapter 3 and verse 15 that no, anybody that hates his brother is a murderer and no murderer has eternal life in him. You think of some of these religions today that, that murder. Listen, God is a God of love. 
but they murder people for their religion. There was a little case not too long ago, one of these countries where a family killed their daughter, or tried to kill her, I think, because she looked at a man. That kind of religion. What kind of a God are they serving? That's not the God of love. No murderer has eternal life. Those who hate their brother are murderers in their heart, and there's no eternal life in them. Okay. Um, Let's go on and look at three levels in the kingdom. I can cut off at any time. I I could go for a long, long time. Uh, I don't want to wear you out, but... uh, We're looking at three levels here, and we're picking up again in 1 John 2.12. I write unto you, little children, because your sins are forgiven you for his name's sake. I write unto you, fathers, because ye have known him that is from the beginning. I write unto you, young men, because you have overcome the wicked web. And then he writes to little children again. I write unto you little children because you have known the Father. Now he writes to little children twice in here. Let me just explain this because if you look at this in Greek, John is speaking to two groups of little children. The first one that he mentions, technion, is... He's addressing newborns in the kingdom, people who just get saved, newborns. The second group, this last group, Padion, are half-grown children, you know, like maybe 12 years old or something like that. He's writing to two groups. Now, really, these three groups fit into the tabernacle scenario, outer court, holy place, holy of holies, But you actually see two groups in the outer court. You see newborns whose sins are forgiven. Then you see those who have advanced from that. They haven't maybe maybe accepted the baptism of the Holy Spirit or or whatever. But there's actually two groups here mentioned. Half-grown children, second group. You know, little children... You have known the Father. You know, Jesus wants to introduce us, wants us to know the Father through himself. But you see this outer court, little children, the two groups, young men, you've overcome, holy place. And then the holiest place, the fathers. Verse 14. I have written unto you, fathers, because you have known him that is from the beginning. That is Christ. It was with God from the beginning. I've written unto you, young men, because you're strong and the word of God abideth in you and you have overcome the wicked one. So the fathers have known Christ. They know him intimately. And actually, if you look at the end of the first century, there could have been people literally that knew Christ because there were probably quite a few people alive at the end of the first century, who had known Christ. John was one of them, of course, but we're talking something spiritual here. Fathers are those who know Christ intimately. Young men are those who have the word in them and they've overcome. Well, in these last days, we hope to advance the church from the little children's stage to parenthood. Now, in 1 Corinthians 4, Paul says you have 10,000 instructors in the church, but few fathers. Now, if you look at this word instructor, instructor, it's like boy instructor like boy tutors. You have 10,000 little boy tutors in the church that 
In, actually, that word, pedagogus, was a, a tutor that, that basically took the children to school and then waited outside and came back to pick them up and they kind of escorted them to school and back. Paul said, you have 10,000 boy instructors, boy tutors, but few fathers. What the church needs today is fathers and mothers. Because when revival comes, you have little children. And so there has to be a development. I, I appreciated a story I heard once of an ophthalmologist who went to Indonesia, make a yearly visit. In fact, I think there was a group of them that went to Indonesia, where we happen to be going here, by God's grace. But when he would go, he would get the all of these eye doctors together and find out what level they were on and then try to bring them up to the next level. That's what we hope to do when we go to these places. We try to take them from the level that they're on up to the next level. Because we want to see fathers and mothers developed. The church is full of little children not full of young men or fathers. Amen. So let's hope that you here will be developed into full stature. Amen? Mothers and fathers. Because whether you believe it or not, revival is coming and there will be a multitude of people that do come and they will have Big time problems too. Okay, let's change subject here for a moment. And let's talk about the world. Nice subject, huh? World. So we're looking at verse 15 through 17. Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life, is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world passes away, and the lust thereof, but he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. Love not the world. Does that mean that we shouldn't love the, the birds and the bees and the flowers and the trees? I mean, I love the creation. Um, I've always been kind of close to nature. I, being a farm boy, um, traveling around the world, I see a lot of the world. Many memorable scenes around the world here and there. That's not the problem. Well, there are people who do worship the earth. I mean, some of the green earth people or green peace people or whatever. They might worship the world, the earth. But this isn't what the problem is. This isn't what John is talking about here. He's talking about the material world and the spirit of this world. Just remember something. That Satan is the god of this world. Little g. 2 Corinthians 4. 4. He's the god of this world. And his spirit kind of governs this earth. And there's a certain power invested in him. And when he took Christ up on the mount and showed him all the glories of the kingdoms of the earth, and he said, all of this will I give you, he had it in his power to do that. And he's made that offer to a lot of people throughout time. I'll give you this if you will serve me. And so people sell out for fame, for glory, for for riches or something, to be number one. <clears throat> so he tries to allure through the lusts of the flesh, desire for things, fame, recognition. You can be number one. You can be a star. 
you know, a star that fizzes out and ends up in the black hole. You know, we've been watching a little series, a little series of Alexander the Great. He has about, well, the, there's four different sessions, Alexander, and I just happened to watch them this past week, these four sessions. There was a man that was obsessed with being number one. No mountain was too high for him. He wanted to defy all odds. He wanted to do something that nobody else had done. And once they said, you can't do it, he wanted to do it. And he was going to show people that he was it. He didn't care, have any regard for life. You know, he ran his troops into the ground. He wanted to be worshipped so bad. He, his tactics, his battle tactics sometimes really took the enemy by surprise because he came in a way that that was impossible. He came over a, a chain of mountains that people couldn't get over, but he got over them with his troops. Of course, he lost hundreds or maybe thousands of them in the process, but that didn't matter just as long as he got there and he could be number one. He did something nobody else could do. He wanted worship more than anything else. People sell their soul to be number. Who wants to be number one anyway? These poor people that sell their soul, even in Hollywood, see, once they do that, they have to live up to something. And that's a terrible bondage. Because you have to perform. That means... You've got to take drugs, enhancing drugs. You've got to be sharp. You've got to, you've got to be witty. You've got to be Mr. Personality at all times. Who needs it? Who wants it? You can keep it. See, the enemy knows the temptation of, of man. And so when he took Christ up there, he said, All of this will I give you, the glories of the earth. And how many pilgrims have taken that path? And gotten off the path of eternal life for the desire of things. You know, Solomon was taken off the path, wasn't he? Love of things, materialism, women, pride. Demas, Second Timothy 4.10, went back to the world. Love the world. Love this present world. Today, much of the church world is being deluded on this point of things. What good are they? You could be gone tomorrow. Material things. You can have what you want. So they've abandoned principles of self-denial and doing the will of God for, for things. Do I sound harsh up here today? I, I want you to be fully persuaded in your own mind because there is a drift coming and... I'm telling you, a lot of the world is, is getting caught up in the wrong wind. <clears throat> but that's much of the emphasis today, the material world having the best. Not what Jesus taught. Did Jesus ever teach anything about you being number one and you having the best and you deserve the best? Did Jesus ever teach anything like that? Master, where do you dwell? Well, come and find out. Tonight we're sleeping in an orchard. We'll get our breakfast and uh, some gleanings from the field tomorrow morning. Come and find out. Okay, I'm going to wrap this up. And let's go back to this thought of Antichrist. I'm talking about Alexander here. 
Verse 18, little children, it is the last time, and as ye have heard that Antichrist shall come, even now there are many Antichrists, whereby we know that it is the last time. You know, John is the only one who uses the word Antichrist. He uses it five times in his epistles, and that's the only place you'll find it. Little children. Now, this is actually to the second group, the more mature group of little children. There are many antichrists. And what is an antichrist anyway? They challenge what God has said. They challenge Christ himself. Antichrist. And though there are many spirits, many antichrists, plural, that does not take away the fact that there is coming an antichrist, singular, who ascends out of the bottomless pit, somebody who's lived before, as the Antichrist. And of course, the whole world is going to be permeated with the spirit. It is the last time. Now, John said that 2,000 years ago. Well, if you look at what Peter says about a day is a thousand years, and a thousand years is a day. There's only two days given to the church age. So we're in the last days, and our adversary has attacked Christ for the last 2,000 years, challenged his deity, and challenged what he has said. And John says this in verse 19. He said, these are antichrists. They went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would no doubt have continued with us. But they went out that they might be, manif be made manifest that they were not all of us. The interesting thing about some of the worst antichrists in history, is that many of them were in the church and went out. And I'm sure that John is gleaning this from a very, something that never left his memory. And he's thinking of Judas, who was an antichrist, who was of them for a while and went out from them because he was not really of them. I think of one of the, one of the, the great uh, mentors of Billy Graham back in the late 40s, early 50s, Charles Templeton. Billy Graham was greatly influenced by this man who later went to Princeton and he became Antichrist. And he was Antichrist, too. He wrote books about denying God. But John said, you have an unction, in verse 20, from the Holy One, and you know all things. An unction. You have a, an anointing. What separates us from other people, anyway? It's an unction. It's an anointing that God has given us. An unction of the Holy Spirit, which is the spirit of truth. And, you know, I'm going to wrap this up because I... Let me just give you a verse from John 16, 13. It says, How be it when he, the spirit of truth, is come. This is the unction. He will guide you into all truth, for he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak, and he will show you things to come. We have an unction, spirit of truth, an anointing that bears witness to the truth. I remember one time I was talking to somebody. I was sharing the things of God to him. He was a Christian, but not really exposed to some of the deeper things of God. And as I was sharing with him, he, he was saying, you know, 
I feel the Spirit leaping within me and saying amen to everything that you're saying. I feel the unction. I feel the anointing. I, I feel it. The Spirit of truth inside saying amen. There's something that witnesses to the truth. That is for people that love the truth. If you don't love the truth, why well, you might not feel that witness. Then as John says, and we'll conclude here, I'm not written unto you because you know not the truth, but because you know it, and that no lie is of the truth. No lie is of the truth. Well, there can be a little truth in a lie, but there's no lie in the truth. And Jesus Christ is truth. And he's given us the spirit of truth to know the difference. There's something that clicks. And maybe in our next session in February 17th, maybe we'll continue this. But I hope that this has just provoked you a little bit to get into First John yourself because John really is dealing with some winds that are coming through the church at the end of the century and that's why John keeps hammering on certain things he wants to be very redundant and it looks like he's repeating himself and repeating himself and repeating himself because you see the enemy wants to denigrate the, the commandments of God and say, well, we're not, under, we're not under the law. We don't have to keep it. And some of these groups were very wicked, very immoral, because you know, their idea was, well, where there's no law, there's no transgression, so what we're doing is okay. They had a, a lot of leeway. Whatever they did was okay. No condemnation. Well, I believe in legitimate, legitimate condemnation. People aren't living right and not walking in the spirit, then they deserve a little condemnation. Maybe it helps jar them back into reality. 